So you watch the video. Now you're probably going to be, why is this copyright infringement, right? It's not that the baby had bad dance moves that were arrhythmic or, um, you know, anything like that. It was the fact that Prince's song, Let's Go Crazy, uh, was in the background. Um, barely could hear it. It was in the background. And this mother, you know, this is back in the original days of YouTube, uh, before you could share video files like this. That's where YouTube became first of use, was people would upload stuff that they want their family to see. And, and you know, this mom uploaded this video. And Prince was particularly litigious, particularly protective of his works. I mean, he would um, have YouTube take down, uh, you know, fan videos of his concert performances. Um, I mean, just everything he was very controlling of. And even up until his passing, I mean, he didn't allow his music to be distributed digitally at all because um, he thought it undervalued, um, you know, artists and, and their work. Anyways, his label, um, Prince and his label went after this, you know, this young woman in the sense of had her take the video down. She thought it was bull crap. Um, and she actually reached out to some lawyers who represented her pro bono and they claimed that her use was what's called fair use, that it didn't necessarily replace Prince's in the marketplace. It was, you know, not trying to be a derivative use of Prince, Prince's work. It didn't replace it in the marketplace. It, you know, it was low fidelity. Um, it was a small amount and, it, and it, its intent was not to exploit Prince. It was to you know, showcase the, the child and she ended up winning in court. Um, and it was set an important precedent that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. So he points to some of these things in the introduction of his book. So I want you to look at the slide with the dude with the medals and the beard. Apparently has no mouth. Um, at all. Um, but this is John Philip Sousa. And he was a very important um, songwriter um, in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. He wrote waltzes and marches and stuff like that. And uh, Lessig talks about him and dude, John Philip Sousa, now look at this dude, he didn't have a fucking mouth. Uh, did not like two machines. All right, the first one, and we call these infernal machines. The first one was uh, the player piano, which you would put a roll in, and the roll would play the song on the piano. And he hated the phonographs, uh, the talking machines, right? Uh, Edison's phonograph, uh, Berliner's gramophone, whatever it was. He, he did not like these because guess whose music they played? His music, other composers' music, without payment, without permission. And the early music industry, uh, pirated the works of composers, of songwriters, early songwriters, uh, without their permission and without compensation. So John Philip Sousa was mad about that. So he spoke out about that. But he, he wasn't even that mad about the piracy part. Like, he did not like it. But what he was most concerned about was that people would become consumers, not producers of culture. That means that people, instead of, at the time, how did you make music? right? You would experience it live or a lot of families were musical. They simply knew how to play instruments because they couldn't just put on a record. They couldn't just, you know, play the music or turn on the radio. They had to make their own music and they often would buy sheet music and they'd be like, come on, gather around the piano. We're going to sing, you know, songs and play music. And they would do that, right? And so people were musical. And what he thought would happen is that, you know, people would become less musical. They'd be more satisfied with buying a piano roll or, or a cylinder for a, a talking machine and, you know, putting it on and eating a bag of chips and drinking a beer. Um, and that basically we'd become consumers of professionalized cultures and not producers ourselves. And he thought what would happen is that, you know, art, music, et cetera, would be made by professionals, that it would become less democratic. And I'm not talking about democratic in terms of voting, et cetera. I'm talking about democracy of access, more people having access to musical knowledge, to artistic knowledge, to the technologies, et cetera. And that what would happen is um, through mass reproduction, um, where we become consumers, is that um, you know, things would be made, uh, music, art, uh, technology, et cetera, et cetera, would be made by um, professionals, okay? And basically, that's what he thought. Like, you know, like, the, gone would be the day of the, you know, um, musical culture 
uh, of the Publix. And he was very right because for much of the 20th century, we were just consumers of professionalized culture. This drastically changes in the 21st century with the advent and democracy and democratization of technology via computers um, and via various streaming type platforms for music and art um, and kind of getting away from the professional gatekeepers that ruled the 20th century. So Lessig talks about two cultures and I want you to kind of have a sense of these. First is read write. Think about it like this. When you get a document an attachment and it's a word doc and it's a read write document you're allowed to add comments, take away things, delete, you know, whatever. It's a read write document versus a read only document, something like a PDF or even like a locked word doc that you can only read it. The culture we live in now is a read write culture, right? Where consumption becomes the starting point of production. I go out, I look for records. Uh, or I used to go look for records. I ain't going out right now. Uh, go out and look for records, right? Not just to listen to them, but to use them to find 10 seconds on them that I can use to make a beat with, right? That I, you know, so that's, that's where my sort of sense of it, of it comes. My consumption is the starting point of production. Also in read, read write culture, you're able to recreate and remix culture and you're allowed to add to the past, okay? And this is largely considered the new media model where many to many communicate. Someone makes something and puts it on YouTube, it gets shared, right? That's many to many. People add comments that are often scary, many to many. Um, people then download that and do their own remix of that version. Again, so there's, you're in conversation with texts and that's the age that we sort of live in. Versus the ideology and the age of read-only culture, the mass media model where um, culture is made by one entity and the masses um, consume it. This is, you know, you're, this is simply consumer culture. You, you buy a record and you listen to it. You rent a movie and you, and you watch it. You get a book and you read it, etc. You, you don't add anything to it. Read-write culture, you have, you have blogs, you have social media where you're commenting, where you're allowed to add um, to the culture. So he talks about the differences, and this is very important, is that all of our laws that guide things like movies and art and music right, um, were written in the era of read-only culture with read-only technologies, with mostly read-only practices that were popular. Now we live in a read-write culture. And do these laws keep up? And how, how does, you know, um, you know uh, does like this whole concept of, of, of private property and, and ownership of physical goods, how does it extend in a read-write culture where these goods are non-rivalrous, where, where you know, um, you know, that becomes a huge, a huge element? Like, does the law that governs physical property, or at least physical property as applied to ideas, does that work in the era, era when we don't have physical property, where ideas are not encoded as much into the grooves of a vinyl record or into you know paper of a book, but into some sort of you know digital distribution um, and consumption um, method. And that's basically what he goes through in the chapter. You have made it through week one. I have made it through week one. I hope I see you on the other side of this pandemic. We'll get into week two where we talk specifically about copyright. It's a lot of fun for me. It may not be that much fun for you, but I hope you know you're down for the ride. Um, this is the real Dr. Dre, DJ Food Stamp. Andre, I'm out. Take care of yourselves. Wash your hands. You know what I'm saying? Stay inside um, and be nice to people. Uh, especially if you're home, be nice to your family, brothers and sisters and parents and stuff. All right, we out. Sydney 2, 2.30.